we're allowed to go outside again. We won't be trapped in the house. Uh, oil has come down quite nicely, which is great for our oil trade, which is shorting at whatever the heck we shorted at. Oops, trade, after trade, there we go. Traded at 42.51 was the net uh, the net entry for the short, got three of them in. So we're up 15.50 so far on that contract. The stop would be 42 now. So what we do, oh, those aren't lining up. So basically, if this if this trends back over 42, that's the end of the trade. Take the money and run. You don't stick with it after that. That's a great trade. When you make 500 bucks a contract in one session, you know, there's nothing to worry about. Now, remember, though, 42 is our bounce line. We expect the bounciness here. So what we're looking for, hopefully, is a failure at 42, and then we don't have much support all the way down to 41. So the next real support is going to be 41. And that's not the chart. That's the 5% rule that's telling you that. So we got what we wanted. We got we got the weak bounce. Remember, so we can see if it's stronger or weak bounce. Didn't quite get over 25, so it didn't stop out. Stuck with it. Got back down to here. But now I'm going to set the stop over. If it's over 42 now, then it. All right. Five percent rule. You get your drop. You get a bounce. You get to, you get a drop to the line we predicted, which was 42. We calculated that based on bigger math this morning. I'll show you in a minute. And uh, then once we get to our 42, our goal, we know that we have a bounce up to 25 would be acceptable. And we say, okay, so 25 is going to be the cutoff. And we just got to 25. Even if it went to like a little over 25. It's like it's not, it's not hard enough of a bounce. It's not, if you look at it closely, that didn't look like it was really going anywhere, right? Here's the 25 line. So that looked like it was struggling at 25. You have to use your judgment. You can't just set a stop. I mean, it was clearly having trouble getting over 25, spiked over it, but then came back down. That's the end of it. Then it broke down nicely, comes all the way back down to 42. Remember, it had an air bounce off 42 before. Comes back to 42, fails that line, which is what, what that's what it means when you fail the bounce. If you fail to make a strong bounce, it means you're consolidating for a move lower. You bounced off support. You consolidate in the weak and strong bound zone. Why are you consolidating down here instead of up here? You're consolidating down here because you're heading that way. That's all, which is very simple stuff. It's nothing complicated about this. And so therefore, we just say, okay, fine. So it's trending down. So, so far it's trending down. Now, even better, if 42 starts to become resistance to the upside, they can't get back over 42. That means that, that gives us an even stronger indication that we're going to get a strong retrace off 43 which will take us back to 41. This is a weak retrace off of 42, four, I'm sorry, 43. So remember we went from like 38 to 43 roughly. Let's, I mean, not exactly, but let's say we went, we really went from, uh, I forgot what the calculation was, but anyway, so we, we go to 43. So we're basically going from 38 to 43, that's a $5 move, right? That means your retrace on a $5 move is 20% of the move is $1. So retrace number one, takes you from 43 to 42. That's a weak retrace. So now the weak retrace is acting as resistance. That means it becomes likely that you're going to get a strong retrace down to 41. 41 is a definite bounce line. Now, how much is it going to bounce off 41? Well, we fell from 43 to 41. It's now a $2 move. And that means you're going to see a bounce line at of 40 cents. 20% of that drop is going to be um, uh, 41.40. And 4180. And that's important to know. So the so the 4180 is the strong bounce line of the strong retrace. <laughs> it's, it's, all, it's all things within things, it's all uh, chart within chart. But so 4180 is going to be some kind of a support line because it is a strong bounce line from the way down. But if 4180 doesn't work well, doesn't hold up well, that's an even better sign that the whole thing's going to break down. In other words, if if this is generally not a downtrend, if it's only going to be a weak retrace, then 4180 should hold because 4180 is where you would bounce from anyway, even if you have a strong retrace. So if you have a strong retrace and you're going to recover, 4180 should hold up well. If 4180 fails to hold up well, there's not going to be any support until the next until the next bounce line, and this is a bounce off the theoretical drop. So the 4140 line becomes the next point of interest. If that quickly fails, then you're certainly heading to 41. And this is how you determine how much of a stop you keep and how much of an itchy trigger finger you should have 
and how much profit you should take, so on and so forth. But you just got to get used to just calculating and recalculating these numbers as something goes. So looking at the action here, and again, when I say looking at the action, it's really just math. But I mean, look at the action here. We're testing the strong bounce line from the forty-one from the forty-one dollar drop. The fact that that's even in play. Oh man, that's not good. Ugh, it says I'm out of disk space. I hope that's I hope that. In theory, it's saying the recording stopped. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Uh, I thought I cleaned out enough disk space. I'm surprised. So the fact that that's even in play, the fact that it's acting the way we would think it would act, that now that's not bullish because if you think about it, the only reason this is acting as a support line is because 41 is a real support. So we're very much looking like we're going to 41. Now, how did I pick this play in the first place? What made me say short oil here? Well, that's easy. I mean, if we went, first of all, we went, whenever you go up 20% for no good reason, you got to expect it to normalize. That's, that's one good, good reason to explain it. Um, so, you know, here's oil. For how long? This is oil all summer long. 4150, 4250, 4378, 4172, 4190. So getting back to 4250 today, not that this is reflecting it for whatever reason. What is this, not live? It says it's me. I do pay for this. Interesting. Ugh. So not getting back to, to well, let's look at the other, let's look at FinViz. Where's my FinViz? What is this? FinViz on all the futures. Futures, futures. Oh, is that the NYMEX? Oh, I want that one too, though. Let's talk about that. Let's get really into this stuff. Finviz. No, futures Finviz. Finviz futures. Energy. That's going to give me a better picture. So 42.50 is here. This is where we got to 42.50 today. You see how bullshit it is? This is a little teeny tiny spike when you look at it in context. When you look at the hourly chart, it looks like that. But when you've got to pull back and look at your view, this is a nothing little bullshit spike. And we know it was happening in the pre-market on low volume. That's not a real number. And then we know that this line up here, which is 43, right there, is really the tippy top, right? Yeah, of course it spiked up a little higher, and it's not and it's not a little, it's 45, it's almost 44. But the point is, we weren't able to sustain this at any point during the summer, no matter what people thought, no matter how much stimulus, no matter what. So why are we going to support, why are we going to sustain it having a 20% run up to sustain it all of a sudden here without even a pullback? So I expect at least a pullback off the, off the line of resistance. And even if it went to 43, even if I got burned, and even if I lost money here, I still think 43 is going to get rejected also. And how much is it going to get rejected? It's going to get rejected by a dollar. So the risk reward on the trade is great. I don't see how I'm going to lose more than 50 cents. That's highly unlikely. I could make a dollar or two dollars on a weak retrace would be a dollar. A strong retrace is two dollars. So that's the time to play it. And notice we haven't played oil in a long time because it hasn't been predictable because I have no interest in playing oil when I can't predict it. That's why I'm good at picking things. I don't play them until it's time to play them. You know, in other words, um, you know, if I'm going to call a football game and I wait until the end of the fourth quarter to make my prediction, <laughs> and, the, and the team is up by, and my rule is as long as the team's up by two touchdowns in the fourth quarter, I'll, I'll say that team's going to win, then I'm going to have a very high percentage of, of correct picks. I, 
and, and unless I'm betting against, uh, you know, uh, yeah, unless I'm betting against like somebody who makes huge comebacks, like uh, what's name, like Montana used to, Joe Montana, you could never bet against him because he was down by two touchdowns. So, you know, it, it's if I if I wait until the end of the game, or if I wait until the situation is right to make a bet, my percentage of correct picks is going to be much higher, right? It's pretty obvious. And all it requires is patience. You wait until it's the right time. So I didn't want to pick oil up or down here or here or here or here or here or here or here. We didn't play it. Why? Because it's a, because it was not because I wanted to short oil. I mean, here we didn't short. I think we did go long with like an SEO play or something like that. But I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go long or, or short the futures. But then once it gets back to the top of the channel and the situation, the fundamentals haven't changed, then of course I want to short it. Oh, wait, I get rid of that. Then of course I want to short it. But, you know, you know people say to me, I get, I get notes from you, how come you don't play the futures anymore? I don't play the futures when it's not good to play the futures. I play the futures when it is good to play the futures. Now it's good to play the futures, so I make a call. But the problem is, and I'll tell you guys this, because you all do it. Uh, the problem is, then people say next week, they go, how come, how, and oil's back, let's say oil's back here next week. And then people say, well, what's the oil play today? What are we doing? And my answer is nothing. I'm not, it's not the top of the channel. I don't feel comfortable betting in the middle of the channel. I'm betting at the top of the channel because it's obvious. I'm betting at the top of the channel because we ran up from 34 to 43 is nine bucks, which is like 30% over here. This total run is like a $9 run, but we had some consolidation here. So really it's more like 38 to 43 is a $5 run. So we call this a $5 run, and that means your pullback is going to be 20%, $1 is a weak retrace, 40%, $2 is a strong retrace. So what we expect to happen is at least, at least a weak retrace to 41, to back to 42. At least a weak retrace is expected. Therefore, since my risk at 42.50 and, and, on, and honestly, I missed this. If I'd seen it in the morning, I would have, I would have caught that at 43. But if my risk at 42.50 is only going up 50 cents, but I still think very, very strongly that even if we get to 43, we're going to pull back a dollar. So, uh, so for me, personally, I don't care if I double down, triple down here, but as it turned out, we got a nice turn at 42.50 this morning. We didn't have to do anything, just wrote it down. But there's nothing to this. It's not a complicated bet. It doesn't require a master's degree or anything to figure this out. Now, the other thing fundamentally, though, is we, we talked about this a week or so ago on the NYMEX. Whoops. Da, 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 da. You look at the oil contracts. What is this? Oh, there we go. You look at the oil contracts, and here's what their problem is. They've got a lot of open December contracts. That's the contracts we're trading now, 246,000 open December contracts. They've rolled a lot of them into January already. But they don't want these contracts. What the hell are they going to do with them? Who's going to use this much oil? That's, a thousand, that's 246 million barrels of oil. They're 1,000 barrel contracts. We import, uh, not import, we, we use in America 19, 18 million barrels a, uh, a day of oil. So this for the month of December is 240 million. So basically it's, it's 10, it's about almost, almost a half a month's worth of oil. And that's in Cushing, Oklahoma, which can't possibly hold that much oil. It can only hold about 50 million barrels of oil. So the whole facility can't handle this much oil in the first place. It's, it's just a trading block. It's complete vapor, vaporware, fake demand, not real at all. Nobody actually wants these contracts. And now the problem is how do they get rid of them? They get rid of them by rolling them. And now it's already, and what day is it? It's already the 11th. So they got to they gotta get rid of these in like, in like 10 more days. So they've got 10 days to dump all these contracts. And look at this churn rate, 313 million barrels. Uh, 313,000 contracts traded, and there's only 246,000 open contracts. These contracts are trading, every single one is trading more than once a day. 
just a complete frenzy and people are going to get their asses kicked on this stuff. So, and, uh, and, and, and it's based on, you know, it jumped up very quickly, but it didn't jump up for good reason, but it did allow them to roll their contracts into January, into February, into March, but this is still way too many open contracts. 300, 300 600, what? 600 uh, million barrels open when there's basically no demand. And they're hanging their hats on what? They're hanging their hats on an API report that says there is a 5 million barrel draw. 5 million barrels out of billions of barrels that are in the United States, 5 million were drawn down for God knows what reason. And that's when we go over to the, um, to the report, where's the oil report? Um, oh, I thought I had that. Future is crude. Disclosure. All right. So now we're going to look at the petroleum status report. And this is going to be for last week because um, it's there's no there's no oil report today. So let's see. Oh, sorry, it's chip a week. Well, it's 10.30. So through 10.30, so we're using, here we are, we're using 19 million barrels a day. We have 2 billion whatever barrels total. Last year, this time, we had 1.9 1, 1. billion barrels. So we're up 5% more barrels than we had last year. Oil was 4.46. It's at 4.84. That's up almost 10% from last year. Gasoline, 217, 227, that's up 5%. Um, uh, what's other oils? And other oils has a bill too. Even other oils has a bill of, of uh, 20 million, not a big bill, but a little bill. But the point is, this is, this is just, this is where it's building up to. We have way too much oil. Gasoline is selling for barely less money. It's selling for, uh, well, a little, I mean, the, what? The, 50 cents less out of 260 is what, 20% less. So gasoline's 20% down, oil's significantly down, oil's down from 56 to 35. But you're not, you know, it's not gonna come back really fast. You're not gonna get back to last year's level. Last year, it was 21 million barrels a week, a day, sorry, a day. Now it's 18.8, that's two something less. Um, and we're exporting, and look at this, we're even exporting more. So, so to get to this number, to get to this, we're exporting, what, 400,000 roughly? Yeah, so 400,000 a day less. So 3 million barrels a week, we're exporting out of the country in order to get this 5 million barrel draw. And, and that's 3 million extra. In total, it's three times seven is uh, 21 million barrels. We're exporting more than a day's worth of our usage to try to keep the numbers down. It's it's all fake, it's bullshit. And, and that means that when you see the oil jump up 20% because there's a vaccine, the vaccine doesn't affect usage today, the vaccine doesn't affect usage next month or the month after that. It's gonna take ages for that to seep in. So, it's, it's, so these traders are being idiotic. Their trading is stupid and we take advantage of that. And that's when you trade the futures, when the time is right to take advantage of it. You don't, the, you know, the, the problem most traders have is that they sit down and they say, I wanna make a trade. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna trade today. That's what they do. They sit down and they say, I'm gonna trade today. And so they trade. And it's like, it's like a pitter when you decide you're gonna hit a home run, that you're, I'm gonna save the game and hit a home run. That's the worst thing you can do. Don't try to be the hero, and the same goes for trading. Don't try to hit a home run. You get up there, and if you get a pitch you like, you swing at it. If you don't get a pitch you like, don't swing at it. And that's what you have to learn to do. You have to learn not to swing at bad pitches. And you get a lot of bad pitches in this market. You really do. But when the situation is right, when I don't see a reason, when oil goes up, there's no good reason for it to go up. The situation isn't right. The macros haven't changed. The fundamentals haven't changed. 
then I'm going to short oil. But the worst thing you can do is to sit down and stare at your screen and look at your charts and go, what can I play? What can I play? I got to play something. That's a terrible way to trade. I, I sit down and I say, is there anything worth playing here? So he, I, get, I go through my thought process. I look at the Dow and I say, well, when it gets to 30, I'm going to short that. But does that mean I short it now? No. When it gets to 30, I'm going to short that for sure. Um, S&P, mm, probably 36,000, also a good short for S&P. NASDAQ, 12,000 for sure. We're going to short 12,000. So, so these are all coming up to really good shorting spots, just mechanically. The Russell, 1750, looks like it's going to be a good shorting spot. 18 for sure. I would love to short if it gets up there. Um, so these guys are all coming up to shorting spots. What does that mean? And now I got to say, well, if I want to short everything, if all of the indexes are having runs that are overdone, then doesn't that mean I should really be careful about my stocks? So that means I want to start looking at stocks I can get out of or stocks I can short. I'm not really looking for longs, so even though today, and I have to bite my tongue, because this morning when we were doing the, um, the report this morning, All right, there are some good Dow stocks. Okay, not not super overpriced. See, and this is what I was saying about the P's of the Dow this morning. I was very upset because I said, look, you're getting to a, an average of a, uh, what was my average? I forgot. Calculate it somewhere. Oh, P, if you add these up, and now, now I arbitrarily gave 100 PE to the companies that are losing money. So Chevron, Boeing, Disney, uh, Chevron, Boeing, Disney, and Dow are all losing money. So I put their PE at 100. Now, realistically, I would give Boeing a 20-something, a low 20s. I'd give more, I, I would say give them more 25s to say historically, more realistically, they're probably going to be at 25s. And if you do that and you knock, well, I can tell you what it knocks off. So we're going to take off 75 from four components out of 30. Oh, boy, wait a minute. This is going to be tricky. Let's see if we can figure that out. Um, so we're going to knock off 75 times 4. What? 75 times 4 is 300. Oh, 10. Divided by 30 components is 10. And then I would have to divide that by three, no, by 30. That doesn't seem right though. Ah, I know a better way to do it. So if my average, ah, let's, that, there you go. Let's work on the actual facts. If my average was 39.45, times 30. So that's how many points we had total. And then if I subtract 300, and now I redivide that by 30. Oh, that's a pretty big change. So 29.45, so realistically, all right, so just so you understand what I did, I took away these hundreds because they're kind of arbitrary. And I'm taking away these hundreds for the losses because they're jumping, you know, jumping, and, and we're assuming that things go forward and they improve and so on and so forth. And you could say that about these guys too, about Salesforce and a couple of others, but you don't know for sure everybody's going to improve. Nike is obviously shouldn't be at 75. But I'm talking about the guys who I just made up a number. I called them lot, but since they're losses and they're technically have no PE. I just said they're 100, but realistically, they'll come back. They're all good companies. So, so let's say the Dow's at 29.45 versus a normal 16. All right, so now we take um, divided by 16, and we're 84% overpriced on the Dow in general, or overpriced towards a, a realistic, a good, solid PE ratio, about 80% above the normal level. But then you say, well, that's not fair because Apple obviously should have a better PE. It's just been a bad year. A lot of these guys should have a better PE. So let's say it's 20% overvalued, 30% overvalued. But either way, it's overvalued by quite a lot. 
When you're at 30,000 and you're 30% overvalued, that means that 10,000 of your 30,000 is overvalued. That's very overvalued. <laughs> I don't need your way to put that. That's pretty freaking overvalued. So you've got to think about that. And, and look, we haven't been, we haven't been at 20,000 in ages, right? So that's, that's miles down here. It's down here. We were well, in ages. I'm sorry. We were at 20,000 in March when people were worried about the virus. <laughs> when we had, when we had, what, 50? I mean, this is when Trump said, don't worry, we only have 15 cases, <laughs> whatever it was. Now we went down here. And now we're all the way back to as if it never mattered. But 29.6, we were at 29.6 before, now we're at 29.6 again. Where are we right now? Oh, stupid Bloomberg, you can never tell where we are. Anyway, we, oh, 29.5, so we're at 29.5 now. So that, that was, the, that was the, the pre-crash high. Now we've gapped up to here. We're testing the 3,000 line again, tested it over here too. But this is not the right number. It's clearly not the right number. There's no way that you can get to here. And even if we knock it down, even if we knock it down to 29, wherever the hell that went, but even if we knock it down to 29, still way too high. So even if we give these guys this, even if we say that, even if we say they'll do much better and they'll do much better and this one will do much better, blah, blah, blah. Even if you give everyone everything, you still can't get to the ratio we're at now. That's a clearly overvalued market. It's not a good market to play. And I'm sorry, I wish it was always a good time to play. It isn't. It just really is not a good time to start making dangerous bets. But while I was going through this, as I said, I had to bite my tongue. Verizon, 13, 14 times earnings in this piece of shit environment, they're doing good. Travelers in this terrible environment, doing pretty good. Intel, well, you guys know I bet banging the table on Intel, right? Intel, Intel, Intel. Best PE in the Dow. Goldman Sachs makes money no matter what happens. The world ends, they make money. <laughs> Cisco, another great company that I love. That's one we should be adding to, our, to the portfolio. So it's not like there's nothing to buy. But it is like, why would I buy American Express? Why would I buy Apple even, who I love, but I'm not gonna, it's too expensive. Caterpillar I love, too expensive. These are not bargains. IBM, another good one, forgot about them. That's another one, obviously, that I love. Um, JP Morgan, good one. McDonald's, 33 times earnings? I mean, come on, what are we doing this for? Why would we chase these things? It doesn't make any sense, especially it's not like there's nothing else to buy. There's five or six stocks here you could buy, Dow components. If the entire Dow goes up, if the Dow goes crazy and goes to 50,000 or whatever, you think you're not gonna do better on these? Yeah. There's still gonna be a bargain. They'll still be lower than the rest, but they sure ain't gonna be uh, 13 times earnings when everybody else is at 50 times earnings. People will come and they will buy the same premise that makes you want to buy Visa and the same premise that makes you want to buy Nike or whatever at stupid high prices is that the Dow is going to keep going up. The stimulus, the this, the that, the recovery, this and that, whatever bullshit, doesn't matter. That same premise applies to the other six components that are half the price, half the ratios. Twice the value. There's a lot of different ways to say it, but they all mean don't buy the expensive stuff, buy the cheap stuff. It's not freaking wine. <laughs> it's stock. It's not wine. <laughs> you don't drink it. You're not consuming it. Okay. It's a it's an item you have that does a job. It, it's a it's a store of value for your for your finances. Take the lower cost store of value. You don't need the expensive one. It's not necessary. It doesn't make it better for your portfolio. It actually makes it much worse. So 
So JC says, any way that you can recommend shorting oil other than using the futures? Um, honestly, you could have done that first thing in the morning, but I, I wouldn't chase it. It's not. It's a short-term play that we expect to be getting out of today, and that's the end of it. We're not going to. We're done. Oh, see, it's coming down nicely too. How are we doing? See that sixteen hundred? Very good. This will come down nicely. So. Um, You know, this, this is a one-day play. I'm expecting a pullback, and we're playing for the pullback, but we're not playing for a long-term deterioration in oil. We did play for a, a rebound in oil. And, in fact, when oil was high, we played for something. We took, I forgot what we took. We took something in the short-term portfolio. Uh, but it's not there anymore because we got rid of the short-term portfolio. Oh, I don't have the, um, I don't have our portfolios up. Oh, well. Uh, so. Excuse me. Tired today. What was I gonna say? Oh yeah. So um it's not it's not like a long term play, it's just a short term play. It's ideally situated for futures trading. I mean, I think the better the better plays are uh like Friday. Let's go back to Friday. <laughs> Ah, oh, look, the world was so much bleaker on Friday. <laughs> no stimulus, no president. Have a nice weekend. I was I was very upset on Friday, and now I'm super happy about everything. <laughs> Although I'm not happy about this Trump bullshit, but he'll go away eventually. It's like uh, he's like herpes. He, he's trying to come back. <laughs> Let's see. Um. So we've got uh, what well, we had. We had TZA, and we rolled the uh, we rolled to the April spread. So so that should probably be better than where we are. So we have the January 25th. We rolled it to April, but we made a spread out of it to lower the damage. Um, we had CMG that probably isn't doing well because I'm sure CMG did better. Uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. Let's take a look. Yeah. Hmm. CMG. Yeah, no, no biggie. Not a big recovery for them. So 1311. What's the crux of our CMG play? It's um we have um the 1300 1, bear put spread. So in, in 2022 we expect it to be a low below eleven hundred. We sold the January 1300 calls, but we sold them for 83 bucks. They're still 83 bucks. So that doesn't make much of a difference, but we are just waiting for the premium to expire. They're pretty much all premium with, with um, CMG at 1310. Um, then we had, and then also in January with the 1050 puts, we don't think it's gonna go crashing down that hard. So therefore it offsets and balances this out. So we sold, uh, da, 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 41 plus 13, uh, 42, 45, 55. We sold $55,000 in premium on 1028. That expires. So on November 1st, basically, that expires January 15th. So that's November, December, and 15 days into January. So it's a 60, 75 day trade that we made on CMG. Sold fifty five thousand dollars in premium to get added to the portfolio, and did we make an adjustment? Oh, I said buy back the short puts because I was worried about a crash, so we bought back the short puts. All right, so we're not going to gain that. We're not going to gain that. So we unsold that premium at about at about even. They're all it wasn't even. We made a ten thousand dollar profit. Oh, that's pretty good actually. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I didn't realize. Oh. We had a three, I'm sorry, we only, there was only 3,000 left. So we took the 10,000 profit off the table. So yeah, we sold, what I say, $55,000 worth of premium. We spent 3,000 to buy it back. So we still sold 50, $48,000 worth of premium. And so, and we collected 10 of it already, leaving $38,000 worth of premium still outstanding. And now we're waiting, and now all we need is CMG to go lower between now and January. Now, don't forget that was Friday. I didn't know they were going to cure uh, or have a vaccine 
that would hopefully help Chivolti, but still doesn't help him that much. I mean, geez. Let's take a look at this. This is Tears Chipotle, CMG. I mean, talk about out of control. Okay. Well, now I need Yahoo. Somebody tell me, do we have Yahoo? CMG. I mean, it says right there, 156 times earnings. Chipotle's value, $36 billion. $36 billion. What am I getting for $36 billion? I'm getting $5 billion in revenue. They are selling for six times sales, close to seven times sales. That's insane. That's sales, not profit. The profit made on six on 5.5 billion in revenue is $350 million. $36 billion for $350 million. That's an insane valuation. That's why we're shorting them. I short things. Because I expect that the world will eventually be sane. And you know what's funny? Now Donald Trump's not going to be president anymore. We have a much better chance of the world turning sane. That's when we make money, baby. <laughs> when people when people are rational, we can make a fortune. So recently, Chipotle, they had a nice first quarter, 76 billion in income, uh, 76 million in income. Then 8 million shitty second quarter, then 80 million in the third quarter. They had a nice recovery. Very good job, Chipotle. They might get back to this pace over here. And that pace is going to be, let's let's say, 400 million in profit. Let's say five. Let's say six. There's no number you can get to that justifies this. This is a freaking restaurant. They would have to be making... 1.8 billion dollars completely unreachable completely unreachable in the next decade kind of money just to get to a 20 times earnings that's with going that would be going up to uh what are the current sales three four hundred three three or four hundred million so 1.8 billion so they have to go four times sales how are they going to do that they got to go to four times sales. They're not going to do that. They go to two times sales and their PE is 40. Not two times sales, two times profit. You know, doubling the red number of restaurants doesn't necessarily double the number of pro the profit. And, and obviously doubling the number of people coming into your restaurant is not likely. So these expectations are just unrealistic. They can't grow into that number. Now, don't forget, Chipotle originally came out of McDonald's. I mean, actually, what happened is Chipotle was a separate company. McDonald's liked him. They bought him. They built him up, and then they flipped him. So that's how it worked, which was brilliant at McDonald's. I can't believe they didn't do that again. But McDonald's has $162 billion valuation, 34 times earnings, but not 134 times earnings, 34 times earnings. And that's crazy high. That's not justifiable. What, look, I mean, look at McDonald's profile. I mean, you, you don't need to see it, but I mean, it's here. Um, company operated 38,000 restaurants. But that doesn't, that's actually not, that doesn't, that can't, that can't include the franchises. See, so now I have to know. See, I always have to know stuff. How? Well, that's probably what makes <laughs> that's probably what makes me good at doing analysis. So I can't let anything go. How many McDonald's are there in the world? There you go. Oh, thirty-eight thousand. This figure is you know, thirty-eight. The number. Well, how many McDonald's are there in the world? McDonald's, McDonald's, McDonald's. Okay, so there's only forty thousand. It's a lot less than I thought, really. That's weird. All right, but anyway, so thirty-eight thousand is a lot. How many? 
Starbucks. Should be more Starbucks and McDonald's, right? Nope, 31,000. So there you go, that's that saturation. And that's the same problem Starbucks has and McDonald's has. How many freaking things can you have? You, you already know, if you're a New Yorker, for, <laughs> you know that you can literally see two, three Starbucks from the Starbucks you're in. There are many corners in New York where you can literally see three different Starbucks while you're sitting in a Starbucks, in a different Starbucks. So on, on three corners or three streets, you will see a Starbucks and a Starbucks and a Starbucks. And and I, I most malls have two Starbucks. They don't have one anymore. They have two Starbucks. How many places can you put something? And when you think about growth and you have these numbers, so let's go back to McDonald's because that's the one that's in front of us. When you're looking at McDonald's and they have 34 times earnings, that means you're only getting 3% back on your money. Now in this environment, yes, that's 3% back on your money is good. T-bills don't pay you 3%. Junk bonds barely pay you 3%. So it's almost rational to put your money to McDonald's. They pay a 2.4% dividend and they're, and they're making 3% on your money. Doesn't get much better than that, really. Not in this environment, but eventually the environment will change. And then you've got the problem of Biden coming in, and there's two things that Biden can, can do, that might do, that should do, probably. Number one is put back more restrictions. Until we have the vaccine out, until we're doing a good job getting people safe, we need to be more careful. So we may go back to a lo more lockdown environment. That's not gonna be good for McDonald's. That's not gonna be good for any of these places. That's number one. Number two though, which is even worse, tax. It's gonna tax corporations. They're not being taxed now. Let's see Chipotle, where's their taxes? Taxes, 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 income taxes. Oh, here you go. Here's, a, here's some good examples. Well, no, that's not. Well, let's, let's go back to yearly. I like this because it goes back a long way. So Chipotle, income taxes, $134 million, 179 said they made 750 457 they paid 179 paid 534 paid 207 714 268 769 298 38, 15, 275, 99. That's interesting. 268, 91. These are 458, 108. Looks like they hit the cap on taxes, apparently. This is what Trump has done. 458, 108. 457, 179. 534, 207, 458, 108. 289, 110, 458, 108. This is going to stop, people. <laughs> it has to stop. It's ridiculous. But what does that mean? That's their profit. If you go back, to 179, then that means they make $79 million less in income after taxes. That is 20% of their profit goes bye-bye. And 20% of their profit going bye-bye means their, uh, oh wait, I'm sorry, this isn't McDonald's, though. it's Chipotle, means their PE goes up 20% because the earnings went down, therefore the PE goes up. Price is the same, earnings got lower. So that's a factor coming up in the market. The other factor, which is very serious, is that your personal taxes are going to go up. If you are collecting, if you're counting on capital gains in the market, then you are going to take a hit next year because Biden is probably not going to say 15% is okay for capital gains. He's not going to allow as many deductions. For us, for people who have money, People in the top 1%, we're going to get a lot less deductions being handed to us. So therefore, if your accountant is going to tell you very shortly, if he hasn't told you already, 
you should cash out your stocks by the end of the year. It's tax advantageous to do so. If you wait until January 1st, you won't know what Biden's going to do. But it doesn't matter because he's going to do it effective for this fiscal year coming up. So you don't take a chance. And believe me, hedge funds are not in the business of taking chances. You take your gains in a tax efficient manner. So, you know, why, so, you know, they, they, there could be a, a very large withdrawal of funds from the market coming up pretty soon. So all this, I think, is going to get triggered at the same time. You're going to hit 12,000 on the NASDAQ, you're going to hit 30,000 on the Dow. And then all of a sudden people are going to go, whoa, we got to call an end to this party, 3,600 on the S&P, party over. Oh, look, very nice. See, we keep making money. <laughs> so, so part, you know, so so these are all factors that you got to be really careful of coming up, and they're coming right up. Not like we have a lot of time. This is happening. It is already November what tenth, eleventh, whatever the hell today is, eleventh. So it's already November eleventh. And uh, you know, Veterans Day. It's usually when we do our our Vegas webinar. What a shame. <laughs> But this stuff is going to hit us very hard, and there's a lot of reasons to get out of the market. So, you know, we have to start thinking about taking those profits off the table. No comments. Either I'm very boring or very interesting. One of the two. We'll see. All righty. So what else do we have to do? <clears throat> so at this point, we want to lower our stop on the oil to 41.75. We want to lock in those gains because we're up a couple of thousand bucks now. So we're going to set a stop. This thing's lagging though, so I have to wait. And basically, so we're gonna put a long, and say one buy here, oh, triggered immediately. But now I don't have to worry as much, right? And I'll put another one here, it'll probably trigger immediately. All right, good. So now I have a stop. So now I have two left, taking some off the table, we're up a couple of thousand bucks, all good. All right, so I'm gonna lock in a $2,000 gain, that's all. That was easy, right guys? So what else are we talking about here? Oh, ah, yeah, right, short term profile. So with TZA, we moved to a hedge. And why did we do this, by the way? We did this because we thought the thing was bottoming and we wanted to be more careful. We wanted to have hedge. If you have a spread, you're gonna get less damage when it goes up. Um, and we did the Chipotle and then with SQQ, we took the $20 calls. We rolled them lower into the 2022 15s and we bought back a hundred of the 15 calls and we sold a hundred of the 2023 calls to collect more money. That was clever too. That's going to work out well. Um, so all, bri all brilliant moves made last week. And since then, I think we added something. I don't remember what it was. So I know we added something to the short term portfolio. And um, oh, and that's, and then we talked about the long term portfolio too. Let's take a look at that. That was back on, um, what date was that? No, not the 14th. Yeah, and there's, look, there's always two places, in PSW, there's always two places you can look for the real bargains. If you wanna find things to buy, there's a long-term portfolio review. Again, it's super big, very easy. Just look at the long-term portfolio review and think about what you got here. These guys are all up a lot, except, well, I'm sorry, my, Mylan Labs isn't up so much. So Mylan, the January, the 202215 puts, you can still sell them for 315. That gives you an entry of $11.85. All right, why do I like Mylan? Okay, they, they're 30 times earnings, it's not super cheap, but they're a good drug maker. They, they've got uh, a, a lot of things going on here. So they just had a profit miss, that was one thing that just happened. So even the earnings were what we thought they would be. But making 36 cents a share, 
is down 2.7% from last year. And it's a $15, 15 60 share. So if they're making a buck per $15 share, then their PE isn't really 30. Okay, their PE is only 30 because of the temporary setbacks. But they're they're really on the path to make over a dollar per share. So their PE is a lot better than people are giving it credit for. And even though they're down, I mean, honestly, um, 36 earnings of 36 cents a share declined 2.7% from last year, missed the consensus of 116. We knew they were going to miss that. There was no way they were going to hit 116. But the point is, this is adjusted net earnings were up 12%. Take a look at this thing. Oh, where'd that nice chart go? Oh, well. Anyway, so if you could see this chart, you would be interested. But the point is, it's a perfectly good company. They got good growth potential. And all we're doing is planting a flag. I'm not willing to buy it for 1564. I never said that. I said I'm going to buy it for, uh, what was it, 1185 or the other way around? Uh, where'd it go? Oh, here. We're willing to buy it. We sold the $15 puts for $350. We're willing to buy it for $1150. $1150 is 20% off the current price. It's really around a 24 times earnings. For that kind of that kind of a, a play on the pharma company, it's worth it. We like that. And we're only making a very small initial entry, uh, $30,000 worth of, of the stock if we if we get a sign. Actually, not 30, so it's really gonna be 22. Uh, at 1150, it's going to be $23,000, right? Yeah, that's right. So $23,000 is a one quarter of an allocation block for us. So obviously, and as you know, if we do get assigned at 1350, what are we going to do next? M Y L. <laughs> So if we got assigned for 1350, let's assume that the, the, the things are basically the same price. We would sell the 13, uh, the, the 1250 calls, let's say for four bucks. And we would sell the, uh, I don't know, maybe the $10 puts would be two bucks. So let's say, let's say we get six bucks. Oh, there goes some more oil. Some more, one of the oil stopped out. So let's say we get six or seven, let's say we get six bucks. For, for and we sell the ten dollar puts, and we sell the um, the uh, twelve fifty calls. So what would that do? That would that would take our net down from eleven dollars and fifty cents by six dollars to five fifty. And if we get a sign, so we get called away twelve fifty, we make seven bucks. Nothing wrong with that. If we don't, if we get assigned again at ten. It would be 550 plus 10, 1550 divided by two is 775. Our net would be 775. Now, 775 on 4,000 shares, 7.75 times 4,000 shares is only a $31,000 entry. We've already committed to 20,000 shares. Oh man. We've already committed to 20,000 shares times 1150. Oh. Oh, that's one. Anyway, so we've committed to $23,000. So $23,000 is what we've committed to now. And by making that change, if we did make that change, then it, then we would end up at $750 times 4,000 shares, $30,000. So all we'd be doing is spending $7,000 more. We still have a $100,000 allocation block. So there's very, very little risk to that trade. And that's why I like it. You gotta understand that about these trades. I like a trade that has a very good risk reward profile. My risk, even when, I, even when I'm selling this, to even when I'm selling these, these short puts to make seven, to get $7,000 in our pocket, I'm selling the puts and I'm thinking ahead and saying, okay, what am I really committing to here? I'm not just committing to to buying twenty three thousand dollars worth of uh, of myelin. I'm committing to buying twenty eight thousand dollars worth of myelin, or thirty thousand dollars worth of myelin, and four thousand shares. So the question I ask myself now is, do I want four thousand shares for seven fifty, for half of this price? Yeah, I do. I'm not. So I'm not paying. 30 times earnings. I'm offering 15 times earnings. 
I'm saying, no, I don't, I don't want a thousand shares or 2000 shares for 30 times earnings, but I do want 4,000 shares for 15 times earnings. That's a commitment I'm making when I sell these puts because I'm not gonna just have the puts. I'm going to follow through and make the next play. Obviously, unless something catastrophic happens with Mylan, but they're a good diversified biotech pharma company. It's, it's not like I'm not worried about that. I like them. They're attractive at this price, so I picked them. I thought we could use a company like that in our portfolio. Berkshire is Berkshire. Berkshire is going to follow the S&P, and we're not worried about the, the 190s conservative. Caterpillar, you know I love them, and they're way in the money, so we're not worried about them. Uh, Plains Pipeline, another one. We, we sold the $5 calls here. We're deep in the money. We also sold the $8 puts because you know what? If we get called away at 5, we'll buy them again. But what do we do here? We bought the stock for 10, but then we sold these guys for 6. So our net is like four bucks. We get called away at five, we have a profit of a dollar. If we get reassigned at eight, then our net is gonna be seven. We're at seven, that's the target. And we, we think it's gonna go higher. Meanwhile, we really pay a hell of a dividend. That's what we're really in this one for. I think they still pay it, let's see. Yeah, 72 cent dividend, 10% dividend. So why not, right? Even in the long-term portfolio, that's money. Let's see, that's, uh, what do we got? 8,000 times 0 0.72, 5760. Oh, and how much money? So our dividend's 5760. We laid out uh 83 one two three minus 18 7 20 minus whoa screw that up 83 one two three minus 18 7 20 minus 8 one two three so fifty six thousand so we lay out fifty six thousand dollars and we're getting back annually. I forgot what the number was, but it was like it was basically 10% interest. We're getting on, we're getting back on the stock. So we get 10%. And if we get called away at five, which is way lower than where we came in, we came in at 10. So even if the stock drops 50%, we fully expected it to drop. That's why we did this. We expected it to pull back tremendously. We were anticipating bad news but the point is we're happy to buy more and to change our bet when we do that but we're not you know given these circumstances we didn't jump in and do anything about it but we've got 56,280 here we're going to make um i'm sorry we get two years worth of dividends so we're actually going to knock twelve thousand dollars off that so let's say minus twelve thousand is 44,280 we're going to get called away at five bucks and then we've got the $8 puts. So we can get reassigned at eight plus our profit. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's, that's how we play these things. So that's a good one. We're not changing that, but we, we, we have intended to get a lot more because it pays such a great dividend and we don't see why the pipeline's gonna stop having, uh, having natural gas in it. That's if anything, there's gonna be more and more demand. Uh, Broadcom, of course, or whatever they call now, um, they're, they've blown away the numbers. So, you know, these are in the long-term portfolio. See, I say we want to cut down long-term portfolio. There's nothing to cut down. This is so deep in the money, it's not going to get hurt. Berkshire Hathaway, another one. Pre basically in the money. We have, we have uh, how many of these do we have? We have, we have three different Berkshire plays now. Um, so apparently we like Berkshire Hathaway a lot. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry. These are these are the short puts and calls for for June. So here, this one's an income producer. So this is 150, 200. We sold the 150 puts. We sold the 220 calls for January. It's not making 220. We're right on target, doing fantastically. So here we sold um, 14,000 something dollars of a uh, of a uh, premium to collect on that one. Uh, here's Cisco, which I was just saying we love. So obviously we're not going anywhere with that one. 
Um, FL is probably right at the money. It's in good shape. Gilead is right at the money. We love that one also. GM, deep in the money. Goldman Sachs, uh, right at the money already. IBM, at the money. IMAX, there's, there's a bargain. IMAX is still really on sale. I don't understand why IMAX isn't coming back when other people are. Intel just talked about how we need more Intel, so that's not a problem. Labus Biotech ETF, so deep in the money, it's not even a thing. Macy's, still looking for that comeback, although it's doing okay. Middleby, so deep in the money that it's not even worth doing anything with. MJ, the marijuana ETF, finally making a bit of a comeback. We're kind of evenish on that set. Um, 3M, in the money. Uh, uh, Philip Morris is... Um, yeah, Philip Morris is low. I, I but that's look at I mean look at the money we're making on this thing though. I mean, it's going slowly, but it's making money. Uh, da, 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 da. Wow, it looks so big when I do it. Uh, we got Pfizer. I just picked them as a new play. Restoration Hardware is. <laughs> we sold the 125 call up to four hundred dollars. Uh, Tangier Family, uh, Tangier Family Factory Outlet. I love these guys, as you know. Another. Big table banging stock for me, and it's finally starting to show and come back a little bit. Um, Simon Property also doing very nicely and and up. You see, there's nothing to sell. That's the problem with the LTFP. Um, Sun Power also has blasted higher, so they're in good shape. AT&T, we just picked again at this price. There's a bargain. I mean, that's how you can find a bargain in long-term portfolio. What's losing money? AT&T just picked it again, said, this is crazy. We have a lot of it. I, I, I even when I have a lot of it, I'm like, we should have more of this. <laughs> why, why do we, I mean, because look, look at the cash outlay for this, 25, 5, 10, 5, 8, 5. So that's 18, 25, about $7,000 net. And the spread is um, 5 times 75 is what? 7,530. Uh, like 30 to 35, it's about a $35,000 threat. So $35,000 threat for $7,000 on AT&T. Why not? That's a great trade. Textron also right on, you know, right on track, doing super well, lots, lots of profit there. WBA has not come back enough yet. Oh, what happened? They pulled back a lot, I guess. They were doing better yesterday. Oh, oh no, no, no! <laughs> Silly me. I'm sorry. That's this is from. Uh, it's not. This is not live. Um, so they bla they blasted higher since then also. Yeah, because this portfolio is 114 now. It's like 130 or something like that. Um, well, 135. It's up about 20 percent since we did this review. You know, so so you know, when you're looking for bargains, the the first place to look is which trades in the long term portfolio haven't paid off yet. And just look at the net nine minus eight. That's even. That's even. This one's about even to where it was. So you can get the same trade for for that now. Um, AT and T cheaper than it was when we bought it. You know, there's a nice way of saying we're losing money on it. Um, wait, wait, what was that last one? Okay, Pfizer barely made any money yet. So that's also still good for a new trade. Very, very easy to figure out. Plus I always, I write good for a new trade too, but next to the trades. Um, MJ ETS, still good for a trade. Up, here you go, IMAX, good for a trade, right? These guys, IBM, still good for a trade because barely any money on it. Um, very, very easy to find things that way in the long-term portfolio. Just go through the portfolio. Whichever ones we're losing on, it's not like there's not a single trade there I don't like. And then step two, control minus a little bit. Just good, a little too little. All right. Then step two, if you're looking for bargains, go to the top trade alerts. Right there. IBM, good one. China Mobile, good one. Goldman Sachs, good one. I see, I said I like them. I don't remember picking that. What made me pick them on that day? Whew, wow. Boy, am I good. 
<laughs> October 14th. What on earth made me decide to pick open sacks on that day? Don't forget our main post from the LTP. There's been some spillover from Main Street to Wall Street. Bank of America's profits are down. Uh, oh, 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 that's right. That was when we had the dip, I think. October, no. What on earth was I doing? Goldman Sachs, oh, 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 I see, because it was their earnings. Oh, yeah, their earnings were so good, I decided they were underpriced. And then they dropped, but that was okay, because it didn't matter. So I like Goldman Sachs. And I said, we don't have much banking in the LTPs. Goldman Sachs is a good one, evil but good. Uh, let's add them to the LTP with the following trade. And again, see how conservative I was, though? Because we're talking um, October 14th, okay? So Goldman Sachs was maybe here. And I thought that was a nice entry. It was like a 205. But at 205, I sold the 210 calls. I'm not looking for it to go to 220, 230, 240. I'm saying this is a pretty good price. So I'm going to bet it stays above this price. That's all. In two years from now, I think it's going to be right where it is right now. But you know what? It's only $10,000 and you get a $40,000 spread. So you make 300% if Goldman Sachs stays where it is for two years. You don't have to be aggressive to make huge amounts of money. Now here's IBM again. Didn't we just do, see that? That's how much I love IBM. Wait a minute, yep, right there. See, I forget that, I see, I do that because it's like, it's, if, it's a, if it's a good trade, I can't stop myself, I have to put it up again. So we had IBM again. Jets was the airplane ETF because I figured they were down too much. And it turns out we were right. Oh, what's this? Oh, this is our future port future is now portfolio. We cashed in the short puts. Okay. Then we've got um EPD. And that was a that was a dividend play. Here's Pfizer and ATT. LNG and Macy's. Good timing on that one. Is Viacom up? Thank you. Table banger, right? You guys got sick of me talking about Viacom. This is why I got sick of. This is why I kept saying Viacom, 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 Viacom. Once it went on to twenty, I was like, "Buy Mr. Viacom" for like three months, right? Every freaking person who asked me what's a good trade, I'm like Viacom. <laughs> Viacom's under twenty. This is insane. I mean, no sense to me. And here we are all the way in September, and I was still liking it. And how do I like them? Same thing. No, I don't care if they go up much, but this is net 575 on a $7,500 spread. Why would you not want to do that? Here's AT&T again. And by the way, it's called top trades. Every week I try to find a couple of trades that are the best trades I see. It, it can be the same thing over and over again because there's not a better trade. Is WBA. None of these names should be surprising to you guys because I talk about them all the time. CHL, <coughs> Intel, AT&T. If they're going to keep putting it on sale, we're going to keep buying it, right? Um, IMAX back in June. Yeah, and I, and I was right. It worked out. It's working out. Um, Harmony. Wow, when was that? That was May. Oh, what an exceptional call that was, right? That, that went well. Um, oh, Ar Arconic, which is that uh, break off from Alcoa. That was easy. When was that? May. So way down, way down here. <laughs> wow. See, I I I I it's funny, I, I didn't remember to talk about these. I'm like, oh well, it's a good trade. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Uh here's 3M. I thought that was that now. This was obvious. Massive come down to 250 on the spot market, right about two dollars. I'm just reading the news and going, hmm, who makes these masks? 
We have this virus spreading across the country. Who makes masks? 3M makes masks. That was a pretty easy bet. And that was when? That was um, May 21st. Ooh, oh, yeah. That was why I did that one. I remember because it was like, why did they go down? I didn't understand the concept. Why would they go down? And again, we don't bet them to go way up here. We bet them to just get back to where they were. I say, oh, 160 seems fair. So we bet the 160, the 130, 160 spread. It's not hard to do these things, guys. So that's our top trade system. So what we do is we pick like every every week I try if I and, and again and I get crap for this from the top trade people because they're like, well, let me pick something every week. I don't always see something I think is great. When I do see something I think is great, I put it in. Like here, October 22nd, CHL, November 10th, which was only yesterday, I put IBM. I happen to come across IBM and thought it was great. I don't all the time think I see something that I consider a top trade worthy comment. But if you look at, I mean, what, what are we like 100% on those trades that we just went over? I'd rather only pick the trades I know I'm going to win. I don't want to pick the trades that are 50 50 just because I have this top trade thing and I should put something in there. That's a terrible way to play. And I refuse to do it. And in fact, that real day, those real daily guys, we had that fight. And that's one of the reasons I'm not doing the real daily thing anymore. Because they're like, you have to make more trades. If you're gonna if you're gonna do this newsletter thing with us, you have to make more trades. I said that's not what I I said that's the opposite of what I tell people. And they're like, but this is a newsletter, you have to make trades. And I said, well, then I don't want to be part of it. I'm not gonna do that. You know, they're like, you don't understand the newsletter business. And I don't, I'm sure I don't. You want to you want to get people, you gotta just make calls, you don't worry about the consequences, you don't care whether they're good or not, you don't care whether they're gonna be successful, you just keep making calls and people will keep subscribing to you because they like picks. They like to gamble, they don't care whether it's good or bad gambling, they just want to gamble. And I'm sorry, I'm not doing it. I just, I just refuse to play. So that's October 14th, uh, October 12th. So you know it's random. It's sometimes it's two, sometimes one, October 8th. So these are days apart, October 1st, September 28th. I mean, so sometimes there's a lot, sometimes it's not. But so if you guys are top trade people, I'm sorry if we're not totally consistent, but it's not that kind of thing. And especially real daily people who are now on the top trade system or in the, or in the uh, chat room. Um, that's just, that's the reason we stopped doing the real daily is because it just wasn't doing what we wanted it to do. So until we decide with those guys, we're actually on hold for that thing. Because they 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 don't they want us to do every time picks, no matter what. And I'm like, I'm not just making picks because I'm making a pick. I'm certainly not making a pick on a Sunday just because it's Sunday and we gotta publish it Monday. That's just ridiculous. Don't even know how the week is starting out. You know that, and that's what I'm talking about. You don't sit down and just trade. You sit down and see if there's anything to trade. You don't jump in and do the trades. Where'd my thing go? Speaking of trades, ooh, look at that. Very nice. All right, we'll see how that goes. So now, it, so, so again, it goes back to keeping the stock. We had a nice dip here, right? Good job, guys. Congratulations to everyone who played that one along. All right. I got to go and do a couple of other things. So if you see if there's any questions or anything. Nobody has any questions. I am amazing. <laughs> Either I'm amazing or nobody's listening. One of the two. <laughs> All right. So what else is going on? Let me see. Um, oh. Oh, we don't have, oh, no virus. We're not even talking about the virus. Yeah, we should talk about the virus. Let's just see how things are looking. Uh, Johns Hopkins COVID. That's what they're famous for now. Oh, well, that's an interesting view. Holy crap. 
Holy crap. <laughs> Look at that. Oh my God, we're going to die. Um, globally, 51 million, almost 52 million. Global deaths, 1.2 million. U.S. confirmed, 10.3. U.S. deaths, 240,000. 20% of the global total. Contributed by America. Now, it has an arrow. What happens if I click that arrow? Uh, deaths, new cases, tested. Well, this is only tested, apparently. I don't know what this is. Where the cases are rising. Every single state. I don't know what the color code is. The redder background, the bigger the upper trend. The greener the background, the downward trend. So almost, I think, North Carolina. Oh, South Dakota is considered a downtrend with that chart. Holy shit. So these are critical, critically bad. I wouldn't want you to have gone parabolic. Uh, North Dakota pulled back from parabolic, at least. Um, my beloved Florida, doing very well. Rhode Island, not doing well at all. So anyway, it's bad. <laughs> it's, it's bad. So, you know, look, the bottom line is, let's to summarize, virus still out of control. Globally and in America, completely out of control. Look how red that is. Remember when China used to be red? This is way worse than China ever was. And obviously, we have more cases today. China. Ever. Total number of cases ever in China. 91,737. I can't even imagine where Taiwan is. Can I read this fast? Am I fooling myself? Oh, Thailand, Thailand, they're having a revolution and they only have 3,800 cases. <laughs> That's pretty funny, actually. I mean, they're like, they're like, they're, they're, they're overthrowing their government, but they're, but they're doing it carefully with masks on <laughs> and taking safety precautions. Taiwan, there you go. 580 total cases, total. All right. Population, Taiwan, 23 million people. Population, whoops. Damn, can't type into the of Taiwan. 600 per kilometer. Thirty-six per kilometer. Okay, I want to, I want that to sink in. Okay, we have thirty-six people per kilometer. They've got six hundred seventy-three people per kilometer. They have twenty times more people per kilometer than we do, and yet they've got a total of five hundred eighty infections in their whole country. You know, and that's the same thing in Hong Kong. That, oh, that'd be interesting. Population density, Hong Kong. That's, oh, oh Jesus Christ, 6,006. So they've got 200 times more people per kilometer than we do. Can you imagine? 6,600 people per square kilometer? New York City. Look at New York. Aha. 
2,700 peaks, 27,000 per square mile in New York. You wonder why New York had runaway infections. That's why. But the thing is that you look at Hong Kong and you say, how do they do that? How do they, how do they, and they're next to China, right next to China. How do they do that? And it's very simple. You just follow the protocols. You wear your mask, you socially, you wear your mask, you socially distance. And that means even in the store, even at the checkout line, even when you're waiting for customer service, you keep your social distance at all times. You follow the instructions of healthcare professionals. That's what you got to do to fight these things. And, and they clean. And I said this before and I'll say it again because Joe Biden's going to make us clean and everybody's going to be pissed off. But this is how it works. You clean every surface all the time. You know, you, you, you spend the money to, turn, to have electric doors at the stores and the malls. And you tell people you have to have self-opening doors. You can't have everybody touch the door. That's ridiculous. And the government's got to support this and subsidize it. It's got to be, it's got to come in. The store owners can't afford to install different doors on everything, but the government has to come in and say, okay, here you go. Here's your allowance. Everybody gets two and a half thousand bucks to, to upgrade their door to an opening door or whatever the hell they cost. I'm not an expert in this thing, but you just ain't make the doors automatic doors. We know how they work. We've all seen them. They're not complicated. Every supermarket has it. Every CVS has it. There, there's obviously plenty of companies that know how to make these things. Put them to work. You need that. You need street cleaning people. You need people wiping down surfaces. You need to constantly clean everything. That's how you get rid of the virus. And you don't have people eating in restaurants. I was at, um, what was it? Well, I was at the Breakers Hotel, which is a very fancy, nice hotel a couple of weeks ago, way too crowded, every single table full. And um, then this week, um, sushi, 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 where'd we go? Um, I took my mom, oh, Casa Sensei, okay, well, it's in Fort Lauderdale. But the thing is, it, it was completely full. They, they've completely removed all the restrictions on restaurants in Florida. No, every other table, every table was full. I was so pissed off. I didn't realize that. I thought that I thought the breakers had some kind of exemption, but it turns out like all the restaurants apparently have now been allowed to completely fill up their tables inside. And that's horrible. And you can't do that. And everybody's like the economy, the economy, but it's it's not the point. We've got to make this sacrifice, you know? And it's unrealistic to think that we don't have to. And that's why that's why the Dow's too high. It's down 84 points right now. But that's why the Dow is too high. That's why there's too much. There's, there's just too much complacency here right now. And everybody's got to think about that coming into these holidays. Thanksgiving is right around the corner. And like I said, people are going to start liquidating their portfolios. And if there's any reason to panic, people are going to just bail out on the market. So, you know, again, our long-term portfolio is so good. It's hard to find, it's hard to sell it, but it, but it also probably should be cashed out. I mean, it's just, uh, I just don't, I can't, back up staying invested in the market when it's so iffy. Cash out, take a month off, relax. I know there's nothing to do. That's the problem, there's nothing to do. But I, I just think it's kind of coming to a very risky period and there's too much change, too many things can happen. Don't believe Donald Trump can still like roll tanks down the street. We could, we could be in for a military coup any day now. And I'm not saying that just because I think it's a piece of crap, but I mean it, it's clearly not without not with not outside the realm of possibility that he calls out the army to like uh, to recount the vote or whatever. You know, you, we don't know what's going to happen. It's a possibility. 
And then whenever there's possibilities, you have to, to do something about that. Make sure your money is safe. Make sure your investments are safe. So, you know, it's like, really, don't take any risks. Don't, and please don't buy these, don't chase stuff. Get more cash. Be ready just in case something happens, just in case that Trump won't leave office and who the hell knows what's going to happen. And he won't leave office. He said he won't leave office. I mean, we're basically, everybody's basically not taking this seriously. The president of the United States is saying he thinks the election was illegal. He believes he was defrauded. He thinks that the, the uh, votes were invalid. He's not joking. He is saying that. He believes that. Therefore, if you follow his logic, he believes that it would be wrong to give the presidency to Joe Biden, who stole it. That to prevent America from harm, he has to stop Joe Biden from taking office. That's basically what he's saying. And the Republicans are sadly going with him on it. Meanwhile, none of them have any interest at all in stopping the pandemic. So the market is acting up because they're thinking, oh, well, Joe Biden's going to fix the pandemic and Joe Biden, we're going to have a vaccine and all this stuff. But meanwhile, what about the what about the increase of taxes? What, what about the lockdown that you're going to have to do if you want to fight the pandemic? Joe Biden's going to fight the pandemic by locking things down. He's not going to fight the pandemic by telling everyone to go, go, uh, go back to Hooters or whatever. It's like it doesn't work that way. There's a huge mismatch here, and everybody's got to be very careful about that. Anyway, now I got to go. All right, guys. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh oh, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Now I got questions. Matt, you guys, ENPH may be the best solo company. What are your thoughts on this one? Be ask me in the chat because I don't have any thoughts on them. Uh, please review support and resistant lines for T and PM. Also ask me in chat because we are now past the point at which I had time to do that. All right. Anyway, thanks, everybody, for coming. Appreciate it. And we'll do it again next week. Take care.